Hey, Vince McMahon, it's time for this week's Stick to Wrestling Podcast. <laughs> oh, no, give me a break. Oh, brother. Green baby, you and me got a groovy kind of love for the Stick to Wrestling podcast. I want to thank Phil Collins and whoever else sang that back in the 60s for writing that song about their favorite podcast, Stick to Wrestling, where if you give us 60 minutes, perhaps indeed, we'll give you a wicked good and raw bone podcast. This is Stick to Wrestling. I am John McAdam. This is a weekly podcast that mostly discusses classic wrestling from the 70s, 80s, and 90s. Uh, if you give us 60 minutes, perhaps indeed, we'll We'll give you a wicked good and raw bone podcast. Stick to wrestling is the recognized symbol of excellence in podcast entertainment. Before we get rolling, I want to invite you to join us on our Facebook group. If you just uh, search Stick to Wrestling, it'll come right up and you're in. We talk about all kinds of wrestling topics and other topics. Like this week, I posted that it was 45 years since the first Sex Pistols album came out. Never had an opinion on that. Uh, if you want to follow me on Twitter, just search for John McAdam and follow the guy who has the Stick to Wrestling logo as his avatar. Let's get rolling. I have one of my favorite guests on, on yeah, I don't have him on often enough. I don't know why, but he's always great on the show. My friend from the 80s, Jeff Bowder. And Jeff, how are you? It is always a pleasure to be on with uh, the man who is the recognized symbol of Chess King. Uh, you mean, uh, Chess King <laughs> used to be in the malls with the skinny ties, John. I don't know if you remember them or not. A Chess King? Are you kidding me? I, I, there, not a month would go by where I... I wouldn't be dropping dollars at Chess King. Did you wear the little Italian boots? That's what I want to know. I'm afraid I did. Okay. All wow. Right. you got, I came out of nowhere and you got me. I had to go into Boston to get those. <laughs> so a absolute pleasure to be here as always. I understand we have a mailbag segment for today. We do. If you are part of the Facebook group, you had the opportunity to be part of the whole Stick to Wrestling, this this very episode of Stick to Wrestling, you got to ask a question. But before we get rolling on that, Jeff, I, I knew coming in that you would have a surprise talking point for me, and you said it when we got hooked up. So well, what's on your mind? Well, so I reached out to my uh, venerable co-host, Lord Barents Rose, and I said, oh, yeah, I got a couple uh, of ideas for show topics. Uh, uh, I got this one, I got this one, and what do you think about this one? And he's like, yeah, give that to McAdam. So I decided <laughs> then uh, that I would uh, throw. So, uh, Andy Barons, are you familiar with uh, the uh, the Superman comic books? Very limited okay. knowledge of. Uh, I, I went through like a, a phase in fifth grade with them. Okay, what, what about Seinfeld? Are you familiar with Seinfeld? I watched it in the 90s, but I probably haven't okay. watched it in 10 years. So they, they have they have something in common, besides the fact that uh, Superman appeared in every single Seinfeld episode, usually on Jerry's refrigerator. But there was an episode of Seinfeld called uh, where they talked about Bizarro Jerry. And just like Bizarro Jerry, there was a Bizarro Superman edition. So my question for you, John McAdam, is we're going into Bizarro Wrestling World, early 80s, okay? Uh -huh. So let's say in this bizarro world, Vince McMahon Jr. does not buy his father's company. And let's pray that Vince Sr. Uh, maintains good health and continues to run the company. He decides that it's time for Bob Backlund to lose the strap. He does not want to go the Hulk Hogan direction. So John McAdam, who would be Vince McMahon Sr.'s? choice to replace Bob Backlund at 82, 83-ish. What do you think? Okay, well, I thought that, I mean, when Don Morocco came back 40 years ago, I thought for sure he was going to have a superstar Billy Graham-type run with the championship, and then he would be replaced by someone. Now, who could that someone be? Ah, therein lies the key question. And that's a tough one. Well, so um, here's what I was thinking about while you're thinking. Mm -hmm. is knowing Vince's uh, history of the guys that he put the uh, the strap on uh, is he went first with the uh, ethnic Italian with Bruno, okay? Yep. Then he went with that. You know, after uh, I'm not counting the very short-term heel champions uh, like, you know, Ivan Koloff, Stan Stasiak. Then he went with the ethnic uh, uh, Latin star in Pedro Morales. 
Uh, and then he, after the Billy Graham run, which, of course, was a little more extended, I think approximately nine months, he decides to go with the all-American, the proverbial white meat baby face in Bob Backlund. So if you're correct in your assumption that Don Morocco would have made a great, eh, let's just say short-term champion, what direction would Ben Sr. go in if he's already had the white meat baby face is he going to go ethnic for his next champion, or do you think he stays with the all-American type? What do you think? I think he would lean more towards the all-American type because it worked for six years. Although the first name that I thought of when you said can't have Hulk Hogan, my guy would have been Butch Reed. That's a very interesting choice. I hadn't even thought about him. Uh, yeah, that would have been ground bread. Honestly, I hadn't thought about Butch. That would have been a very good choice because at the time – uh, that we're talking about 83, 84, uh, Butch Reed was fantastic uh, yep. in the ring, super for, uh, performer, great promo guy. Uh, you know, um, that's a very intriguing choice. The guy that I thought of that had gotten, uh, uh, some national exposure and then he would have, uh, you know, of course he eventually turned, but I think Paul Orndorff would have made an interesting choice because he had gotten over, uh, on TBS as the, uh, kind of the ass kicking baby face. And uh, but I think either one of those two choices would have been interesting. I think in, in, in another bizarro universe where Ric Flair doesn't want to be NWA champion, I think Paul Orndorff or Butch Reed would have been an excellent NWA champion as well. And how about this? What if what if Ric Flair wanted to be NWA champion during the Hulk Hogan era? But Jim Crockett said, no, we're going with Butch Reed because. You know, the NBA has Michael Jordan and Magic Johnson. And who who's going to watch TV and really think that Hulk Hogan would have a chance in a fight against Butch Reed? Well, you know, uh, unfortunately, uh, the time that we're talking about almost 40 years ago, I wonder if there would have still been a stigma with a Southern promoter about making a, let's be honest, a, a black wrestler, your world champion. Now, I understand it was all about putting asses in the seats, selling tickets. And I think Butch definitely would have uh, taken that, uh, you know, uh, ball and run with it. But you have to wonder whether old school Southern promoters would have been willing to do that. Ah, uh, well, I mean, uh, I mean, let's face it. I mean, by this point, it's really in the hands of one person. It's in the hands of Jim Crockett. And, Fair point. you know, Crockett, again, he's in North Carolina. He saw what Michael Jordan did at North Carolina. He saw what, uh, you know. He saw what was going on in the NBA. He saw what was going on. You know, Reggie Jackson was the biggest star in baseball, maybe not 1984, but certainly five years earlier. So, you know, you would basically I would have gone in a completely different direction than the WWF and maybe had gone with Butch Reed as just your ass kicking baby face champion who just, you know, he's your Hulk Hogan. And everyone thinks Butch Reed is going to beat Hulk Hogan in, in a legit fight. Well, but in that time frame that we're talking about, 1983, would Butch Reed have been the choice or would JYD have been a better choice? Butch Reed, all day long, Butch Reed. Well, no, no, I'm just talking because JYD was such a uh, a, a cultural uh, icon and he was someone who had been put in that position by a promoter, had been incredibly successful. Uh, I think that would have been an interesting choice also. Uh, I, mean, I think 40 I think, years ago, you can, you cannot have an NWA champion named named the Junkyard Dog. No, that's one. true. That's true. I'm not talking about. I'm talking about Vince. Uh, if Vince, uh, I'm sorry to make that clear. I'm talking about if Vince Senior had decided to go with a black ah. world champion, would JYD have been somebody more in line of what he would have wanted than Butch Reed? I think obviously in the ring, Butch Reed. Uh, would have been a better choice. Uh, you know, if you want to talk about your, uh, your ass kicker, uh, I think Butch Reed would have been a better choice, but JYD, uh, he might have meant more at the box office, you know? But by 83, JYD had gotten really heavy. I mean, Bill, Bill Watts was on TV apologizing for how heavy he got. I mean, like, oh no, he's, he's got to put on up the extra for the weight. winter. Yeah, that's what, exactly. That's what he used to say, yeah. Bulking up for Kamala. Yeah. You know, and like, you can't have a WWF champion who, is that out of shape, especially given when you had uh, other options? And, and JYD in Mid South was starting to run its course, as every ba every top babyface does, with the lone exception of Bruno San Martino. So one of the uh, guys that we have not uh, mentioned that could have been an interesting discussion. What about one of the Von Erich boys? 
Uh, I mean, if Kerry had his head screwed on straight, but again, that's another bizarro universe because he didn't. Had David not died, well, he did. Well, you, know, you and I probably have the greatest uh, combined uh, – what's the word I'm looking for? We think more highly of David Von Erich than most people. Well, I, I, you know, it's like one of those things if you combined – the three brothers into one guy. <laughs> I mean, he would have been incredible. You know, it carries a uh, physique, uh, Kevin's fly, you know, ability to, to do the flying maneuvers and David's uh, just smarts and mind for the business. Uh, I think he could have been an, imp- an incredible performer. I, I mean, they all had their positives, but they all also had their weaknesses. There's no question about it. They, they did. I mean, David was a little bit skinny, but he died when he was, what, 24, 25. He would have filled out just like his old man did. Yeah, I, I don't think, you know, so, something that uh, I read uh, many years ago is that when the NWO was at the height of their powers in eh, late 80s, around 2000, that David Von Erich would have been the same age as like Kevin Nash and Scott Hall. So think about how many more years that David Von Erich could have been a figure uh, of, you know, of power in the wrestling business, whether it would have been, uh, in the NWA and his dad, if his dad's promotion would have kept going, whether he would have gone to either WCW or the WWF. I mean, he, I think he would have certainly been somebody who would have been held in a certain amount of esteem, you know, by, uh, by wrestling promoters. I feel like I am the first person that pointed out that David Von Erich was about the same age as as Bret Hart, uh, Kevin Nash, Scott Hall, etc. He was so young. Had he not died, he absolutely would have been part of the Monday Night Wars, in my opinion. Jeff, you, you mentioned something. One of the hardest things for me about doing stick to wrestling, which I love doing, but sometimes it's, it's hard to come up with a topic. And you, I, you know, this is show what, like that number 240 something for me. That's a lot of topics to come up with. Try doing it 265 times. I, I uh-huh. will eventually. Well, no, as Breaking Kayfabe with Bowdrin and Barry already has done, thank you. Appreciate that. No, and it is an outstanding podcast. I, I absolutely want you to plug your podcast. Tell, tell us a little bit about it. Uh, it, it's a fun little podcast here on uh, what's the network again? Uh, something about Brian Last. I don't know one of the uh. one of the people. But uh, yeah, we uh, much like uh, we like to say we don't just stick to wrestling, John. See what I did there? Uh, you know, we have a, a variety of topics. Of course, there's always a wrestling related topic, but we also discuss movies, television, music, pop culture. We discuss life. There you go. And by, for those who are unaware, stick to wrestling. It, it's kind of if someone doesn't like something I'm saying outside of the wrestling wrestling realm, I'll get it. Oh, stick to wrestling. And like the name of the show is kind of my middle finger to that. Oh, OK. You know me, my middle fingers to everything. I think we should get rolling with some of these questions. Oh, sir. please, let's. All right. You go first. You're the guest. Oh, well, I haven't pulled up the stick to wrestling site here on my phone. So why don't you take the first question? OK, I will. And this is I like this question, Jeff, because it's like two questions kind of baked into one is from Aaron Cushman <clears throat> at the peak of your fandom. What was your TV wrestling schedule like on a typical week? Jeff, what was the peak of your fandom? Uh Probably, I'm going to say mid 80s, uh, when I was uh, married to the first Mrs. Baldwin, she who shall not be named. Okay. Uh, I would go with the, uh, let's see, of course, the uh, Florida Wrestling Show, noon on WCIX Channel 6 in South Florida. Then we usually went uh, TBS at 605. Uh, remember when there used to be a 605 podcast, John? <laughs> anyway, uh, then uh, we would go and do Sunday, usually Sunday nights on Channel 33. I believe it was WBFS in South Florida. You would do the back to back. You would do the uh, world class, then the UWF show. <clears throat> so it's something along those lines. What about you? I kind of had three peaks, okay, and they were almost exactly five years apart. Number one was 1976 when I first fell in love with it, and then I started getting the magazines. And the TV schedule for me, one hour a week, uh, Channel 56 at 11 11 o'clock on Saturday morning. That was it. We try. I tried getting the All Star Wrestling, which was on at noon uh, from Worcester, and rarely would I get a picture. Sometimes I would just get sound. 
But then most of the time I would just get nothing. Like if there was a cloud in the sky, forget about it. Then five years later, I started going to the, to the Boston Garden for WWF wrestling every month, which kind of upped the game a little bit. It was like a dream come true. I finally got to do that. And then at 1987, I started getting the Wrestling Observer newsletter and started trading tapes. And I got to enjoy not only seeing wrestling from all over the place, but I got to see wrestling from years past that I read about in magazines. And I also got to see the side of the business that, that the Observer presented. So, you know, every time, th- those three times, I got that little boost. <clears throat> well, what was your first edition of the Observer that you got? Do you remember? Uh, I really don't remember. I remember that they were discussing WrestleMania being at the Pontiac Silverdome and Dave saying that they weren't going to fill it, and they did. This was like the very end of 1986. Uh, mine was, uh, June of 86. I want to say it was Carrie Von Eric's motorcycle accident. Ah, that, that, and I know, uh, Billy, Billy Jack, I think either was leaving for the WWF or was in the WWF and leaving there, but it was something to do with him leaving a promotion. So but, <laughs> as always, yeah, I know that's a Jack huge, was something. Yeah. Huge stunner. So, uh, all right, you want me to just uh, pick a question here or go in any kind of particular order or what? I, I want you to pick your favorite question. Oh, uh, let's see here. Uh, I'll take uh, Nick Minecci. Do you think Memphis is the only territory that the Kaufman angle could work in? Lawler was the perfect opponent, vastly, uh, in my opinion, underrated on the mic. That's correct. Uh, and I can't. Think of any other person who Kaufman could have played off of so successfully. Um, I think not only is Memphis the only territory that it could have worked in, it's because I think really he tried to uh, work something out with Vince Sr., who apparently mm-hmm. was appalled at the idea of a uh, television performer coming on a wrestling show and engaging in any sort of wrestling or cutting any kind of promos or anything like that. And so I believe, uh, correct me if I'm wrong here, John, that it was Bill After that put him in touch with uh, Jerry Lawler and Jerry Jarrett with the uh, kind of floated the idea of him coming into Memphis and uh, and working the angle there. And based on the timeline, I certainly couldn't see somebody like Eddie Graham or Bill Watts doing it. Uh, so I think Memphis was the perfect uh, choice to do the angle and might have, in fact, been the only one forward thinking enough to actually do the angle. Well, a couple of things. Um, the Kaufman angle, I mean, I'm not going to say it didn't work, but I mean, you watch some of that as it goes on. You know, the first match drew really well. And then after that, it really started to fall off. There were a lot of empty seats in the Mid-South Coliseum. You could see them on the I'm from Hollywood uh, special or whatever it was. Um, but you know what? I think if you had used it, used it, let me back up a little bit. I understand why the WWF didn't want to do it because they were already selling out uh, all of their major buildings. So why throw something in there that might take them a step back? You need a promotion who wanted to take a step forward. That said, I think it could have worked literally anywhere. No, you can't have any Kaufman wrestling Dusty Rhodes, but you could have him as a manager. I mean, if you're – let's say it's 1983 right after – uh, Andy was doing his Memphis thing. Why not have Andy Kaufman bring the Road Warriors to Georgia and have him as their manager if he wants to do it? I mean, it, w- it would have been no, it would have been huge. Uh, I don't, it's not that I don't uh, agree with you. My problem with that in theory is imagine trying to sell that idea to Ole Anderson. Yeah. You know? Imagine trying to sell that idea to Vern Gagne or, you know, like a place like Kansas City would have been beautiful because it would have absolutely popped the territory, at least for a time being. But really, Bob Geigel and Bob Brown are going to go for that. No, that's why I think Jerry Lawler and Jerry Jarrett had enough of a outside the box ability to think uh, and to look at things and go, yeah. Now, for example, I think this is something with Fritz in Dallas during the doing the whole kind of uh, rock and roll wrestling before events. Junior took the idea with the free version of Von Erichs. That's something I think would have been interesting in Dallas. What do you think? 
It would have been interesting in Dallas, but it, it's kind of the same as the WWF. Like they don't need to take that risk. Like Georgia, you know, their their gates were way down in 1983. Why not try to shake things up? You know, same thing. AWA they were doing well, but Florida was down. Uh, Mid South was a little bit down. Like why not try to shake things up and get your promotion's name in the newspaper? Well, no, th- I mean that's uh, that's a fair point. I just. Uh... I don't see old school wrestling promoters thinking, uh, you know, outside the box to the point where they, you know, could sit there and, and be, uh, you know, like Eddie Graham. Hey, Eddie, we got this guy who's like this TV star. He's kind of a quirky character who is a huge wrestling fan who wants to come in and do something on the, on the program. And Eddie's going to go, well, let's have him go in the snake pit and we'll stretch him and see if he likes it. And if he does, uh, you know, I mean, that's kind of the way those guys thought back then. And, uh, you know, I, I just I, I can't see Eddie or, or somebody like Eddie going for that sort of idea. Well, counterpoint, did Sir Oliver Humperdinck have to go into the snake pit to Jim Holiday? I mean, no, but uh, w- those were guys that were already in the wrestling business as opposed to, you know, somebody who's uh, much like the title of the movie, uh, you know, it came from Hollywood. And, you know, he's not seen as a guy who wanted to get in the wrestling business, who cut his teeth in the business in smaller promotions. This is a guy that was a TV star on Taxi who now wants to do. And it wasn't like, hey, I'm going to commit fully to the wrestling business, uh, you know, for the next couple of years. This is like I want to come in and do some uh, spot appearances to uh, get my shtick over because that's how they would have regarded it. Not as a potential gold mine of an idea. They would have seen this guy wanting to do shtick. And I think the way the old school promoters would have thought about it was this is a guy that's making fun of the pro wrestling business. Here's how I would have sold it to Eddie Graham. Or here's how I would have attempted to sell it to Eddie Graham. Old school wrestling, you had two kind of managers. You had the retired old wrestler, and then you had like a Fred Blassie, a J.J. Dillon, someone like that. And then you had the obnoxious wimp, the Jimmy Hart's, the Jim Cornette's. Jim Cornette was still new to the business, but Jim Cornette's whole thing was, hey, he's this rich mama's boy who's taking his mama's money and spending it on wrestlers. That's how I would have presented Andy Kaufman. Hey, I'm from Hollywood. I have all the money to, you know, spend on whatever I want. I'm going to spend it on Dick Slater. I'm going to spend it on Bobby Jaggers, on Don Morocco, whoever the top guy in Florida was. Well, if you would have said he was going to spend it on Bobby Jaggers, I would have immediately wondered if the guy really knew what he was doing. Uh, <clears throat> the other guys were, would have been. I loved Bobby Jaggers in Florida. I don't know what happened to him after that, but like 80, 81, I thought he was absolutely great in Florida. Uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> I did. I, and like I saw him on Southwest a couple of years later when I got that on cable, and I was like, what happened to this guy? But I don't know. He, he just had, had, he had cow shit dumped on his head. And everyone associated says it was real cow shit. Well, you know, he he wanted to be true to his art. and uh, you know, <laughs> so. True to his art. I love that. Yeah. So, all right. Next question is yours, my friend. Okay. Ah, Can you remember the last angle or match you saw? This is from Lance O'Donnell. Before you got smart, and he says he was the, the old Hershey Park Arena when Elizabeth brought Hogan out to save Savage from Honky Tonk Man. Uh, Jeff, what was the the last angle before you started like getting the Observer and figuring it all out? Oh, uh, let's see here. Um, you know, I I think really what what happened was as I was going to see the arena shows in Fort Lauderdale or West Palm Beach. You're lucky, by the way. I, uh, well, you know, I, I mean, there was a time when we were lucky. Then there was a time when it had really started to tail off, and it was like, eh, really? I mean, how much can you watch Black Bart and Ron Bass? I mean, I loved, you know, Ron Bass and his feuds with Dusty and and uh, and Barry Windham. But, you know, Black Bart, I, I knew that this was Rick Harris and that, you know, this was a, a guy that had been uh, an opening match guy that they were trying to do something with. But the other thing that really is we would go to the arenas and when we would look around the arenas, you know, like say there was a match for the Florida title or the Southern heavyweight championship. And we would look around and go, yep, there's no cameras here. So the title's definitely not changing hands tonight. And we kind of got smart to the fact that, you know, these guys uh, were essentially doing house shows. We didn't know they were called that at the time. So I'm trying and, Hmm, let me see. 
you know, when Dusty left and kind of burned Florida to the ground and took all his crew up to uh, Crockett, and it was just, you know, it, it's funny because people on different groups that I, I'm part of will talk about the glory years of CWF, and they're not talking about the 70s. They're they're talking about 1985 or 86. What? And, and I want to say, are, are, did you see the same promotion that I saw? Because, you know, I don't regard that as like the glory days. You know, Ed the Bull Gantner, I mean, rest in peace. But, you know, uh, and Dewey Forte and those guys was not exactly the the gold, you know, spell of uh, of, of CWF, uh, you know. So, uh Anyway, what, Jeff, what about I, I started getting Florida wrestling on cable in 1986, and I was not smart to the business. Now I'm like, A, this kind of sucks, and B, you know, when they were at the studio uh, in Tampa, everything looked fine. But, like, when they started filming at Daytona Beach or whatever, I mean, you could see the crowd was, was empty. I'm like, this promotion is dying. Well, you know, one of the one of the things I, I've told the story before is that when I went to the initial Crockett Cup in New Orleans and I got to meet – uh, my friend to this day, brother Jeff Steele, and you know we're we sat there in the in the stands just talking wrestling, and we agreed, uh, you know, hey, I live in Florida, I can make uh, tapes of the promotion and send it to you, and he said, fine, I uh, live in Mississippi, I'll I'll uh, tape the uh, the UWF or the Mid South show and I'll send it to you, and I'm like, yes, I'm gonna get to see some friggin' Mid South man, and because I was a huge DiBiase fan, and so he sent me the tape, and it was. I think it was literally within the first week or two that they had switched from mid south to uh the UWF. And so and then I sent him, you know, 4 hours of uh CWF and uh so I was talking to him on the phone and I, he said, "Oh, did you see the tape?" I said, "Oh, man, it was awesome, you know, seeing the highlights of the Crockett Cup and and all this kind of stuff." And I said, "Oh, what did you think of the uh the CWF uh tape?" And he goes, yeah, you don't need to, uh, you don't need to send me anymore. <laughs> I'll still send you the Mid-South show, uh, but you don't need to send me anymore. Uh, he goes, I've seen enough of Kendall Wyndham. <laughs> Ooh. So, you know, and that was, uh, Kendall Wyndham on the, the horse, uh, where Ron Bass had loosened the saddle. Do you remember that one? And, uh, Kendall's riding the horse and the saddle comes off and Kendall goes, uh, fall into the ground and Ron Bass is laughing on the, at the desk. Ah, he ain't no real cowboy. He doesn't even know how to ride a horse and, the glory days of CWF, John. Oh, when they locked Sir Oliver Humperdinck in, in a cage and they, like, spilled milk on him and eggs on and just pelted him with eggs. Yeah, yeah. There it was, was, it was definitely, uh, there were things that were uh, not good that were going on. And from, you know, we still would go uh, to the uh, the local arena in, uh, in Fort Lauderdale, the Venerable War Memorial Auditorium, and, and see uh, you see the guys. Then, you know, we, we would have, like, Barry Wyndham versus Ron Bass would always have a, a kick-ass match. and. And then we'd have to kind of sit through the rest of the card, and you'd be like, eh, I hope the main event's really good. You know, that one of those kind of things. So, so, oh, no, Kevin question? Sullivan has unmasked the Falcon. But anyway. Yes, exactly, yes. So, uh, The last angle, I'm pretty sure the last big angle was, uh, before I started getting the Observer, was uh, Randy Savage crushing Ricky Steamboat's uh, throat with the belt. With the bell, excuse me, and Bruno San Martino going, "Are you happy about this? You slime!" and attacking uh, Savage. Slime, you're slime. <laughs> and even then, like I knew, I was like, "Okay, they're going to have a match at WrestleMania, and Ricky Steamboat's probably going to win the title." Like that's you know, even without the Observer, I'm like, "Okay, I can see where this is going." Yeah. So speaking uh, of WrestleMania, uh, Rob Nelson. Said, asks, does WrestleMania three represent a coming out party for the WWF on a national level? Jeff, what's your opinion on that? Uh, no, I think the uh, WWF coming out on a national level was WrestleMania one. <laughs> so because I mean, it was like, you know, they had all the build up on MTV. And, you know, I, I don't know if people of a certain age, uh, John, that uh, means uh, you and I, unfortunately, uh, I don't think they can appreciate just how huge MTV was at that point, you know? No. Uh, I mean, it was just a – literally, you'd come home from work or from school, you'd flip on MTV for two hours and watch stinking music videos, you know? And then the fact that, like, they're combining, you know, our love for music, uh, you know, whether it was rock or pop or whatever, and then you combine it with our love for wrestling. It was like the perfect marriage for, for people like you and I. So, uh, I think by WrestleMania three, it had kind of, not, not I don't want to say Wayne because I mean, obviously they drew 
uh, 93,000 people to the Silver Dome or whatever the actual total was. Uh, I, I mean, I think that was Vince really kind of trying to put his money where his mouth uh, was. But I think really the first one was where he really attempted to go like kind of on a grand stage. I agree. WrestleMania one was the, the coming out party and having Mr. T, who was a, a household name, jump the rail at Madison Square Garden to save Hulk Hogan from uh, Steve Hulk Hogan and Cindy Lauper, who was also a household name from Roddy Piper and Paul Orndorff. I mean, it was huge. And I mean, Saturday Night Live was still a really big deal back then. And Hulk Hogan and Mr. T were the guests the, the night before WrestleMania. Mr. T was on the David Letterman show. I mean, it was everywhere. But I will say this. I do think WrestleMania three took it to a higher level. Just it wasn't the coming out party. Yeah, no, that's fair. So, all right, uh, I will take uh, next. Brian Crawley wants to uh, know, in my opinion, the biggest blunder in wrestling was Ric Flair going to the WWF. It started off great. The match at the L.A. Sports Arena with with uh, Hogan was hot, but the booking was horrid. How would you have booked Flair's first WWF run debut to exit? Well, let's uh, take this uh, question or comment in a different direction. The fact that they basically had him debut and started running the program at house shows, I think that was a mistake. What do you think, John? I think that was a tremendous mistake. I know I've, I'm not, I, <laughs> let's take a step back. Supposedly, Sid Vicious, Sid Justice, whatever, was promised the, the main event at WrestleMania 8. Uh, the NWA, WCW, offered him the World's Heavyweight Championship at the Great American Bash, and the reason Sid said no to that was to go to the WWF and headline a WrestleMania. And I would have said to him, Sid, you'll get to headline a a WrestleMania next year. I mean, we've had this Hulk Hogan versus Ric Flair dream match land in our laps, and we have to save it for WrestleMania. So I liked what they did. I liked a lot of what they did with Ric Flair in the WWF. I mean, I liked how he accidentally hit uh, Vince McMahon with a chair, and we'd never seen anything like that before. Um, And we saw it in 77, but back then Vince was just the announcer. Everyone knew Bob. by 91 that Vince was running the show. So I like the way they kicked it off with the feud with Roddy Piper. I love the feud with Randy Savage with the whole she was mine before she was yours thing. At the end of the day, I would have saved the first ever Ric Flair versus Hulk Hogan match. And they for real had never wrestled before for WrestleMania eight in Indianapolis. Yeah, no, I think that's uh, very, I, I think that's what people really were sort of anticipating. Uh, in hindsight, I think that, uh, you know, they, they, I know they did the matches out in LA and I think they did one in Oakland. Uh, and I think the fact that, you know, they didn't have like people, you know, lined up around the building waiting to see this match, uh, I think caused Vince a moment of trepidation and, you know, uh, caused them to pause and go, uh, you know, maybe this isn't, you know, the program that I thought we were getting, but, you know, it, it's funny because someone as sharp as Vince McMahon uh, should have realized that if you give, uh, you know, the, if you just assume that this match is going to be a big hit in the WWF, uh, I, I think he was really selling himself short. If he had given it the proper uh, uh, exploitation, uh, the six month to nine month lead up to WrestleMania, it absolutely could have been a monster uh, card and a, a monster uh, feud and stuff like that. You know, Hogan and, and Flair could have carried that off, but literally he just expected it based on the fact that people, you know, had, had talked about these two names facing off. And now here we are. Let me just throw that match out there and we're going to, we're going to run it in Oakland and in LA and just see what happens. Eh, it drew pretty good, but it's not like just this incredible gate. So maybe we need to pull back the reins. And I feel like that's almost what Vince did. Also worth noting, Ric Flair is my favorite wrestler of all time. Okay. Having said that, I knew multiple people who, you know, they just watched WWF. They didn't watch the NWA or WCW. And when Ric Flair showed up, they're like, okay, who's this kind of small, kind of old guy? Why, you know, what's going on here? You know, I will say. I was like everybody else, a huge Ric Flair fan. And every time you went to see Ric Flair, you know, back in the day, you got your money's worth. You know, no matter who he was facing off with, 
But I think <laughs> as the years go by, uh, it, it's like you just you feel like you want to just say, Rick. Go away, <laughs> you know, because you just feel his legacy becoming more and more tainted with all the stuff that you read about him. Uh, you know, and, and I was, watching, I'll give you a perfect example. Last, yesterday I came home from work and I flipped on the TV and the channel I was looking at was replaying a uh, 2010, uh, TNA pay per view, uh, where they had like uh, some sort of cage match and it was like a, you know, like a war game. Of course they couldn't call it the war games and, uh, it was, uh, Rick's team, which included AJ Styles and some other guys versus Cactus Jack's team, which was like, like all the old ECW guys. And before the match, like Rick and Cactus kind of had this little schmaz and, and, you know, they start, you know, Cactus starts throwing the punches. And as he's going into the guardrail, you see Rick just like slamming his head, you know, trying to get color and you could already see his hair thinning out. And of course, this was after he'd had his a farewell match with Shawn Michaels and you're just like, Really, you know, I, I mean, I, I get that it's like, you know, like what Roddy Piper used to call the sickness that it's in your blood and all this kind of stuff. But, you know, at some point he just needs to go away. And, you know, like this, you know, oh, uh, I'm 71 years old and here's my last match. And, you know, we, we should have all known what was going on when when Ricky Steamboat wanted no part of it. Uh, next uh, next question is from Michael Hulse. Uh, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. He says, is there a wrestling arena you never went to but always wanted to? For instance, the Keel Auditorium in St. Louis, Sportatorium in Dallas, Miami Arena, Omni in Atlanta, et cetera. You went to the last two, didn't you? Uh, well, I went to the Miami Arena. I did not go to the Omni or sure. uh, the Omni or as Freddie Miller used to say, the Omni. Uh, For some reason, I thought you did. I don't no. know. I, uh, I, I went to a lot of different arenas. I never went to the Sportatorium in Dallas. That's the one that, uh, and, you know, it's funny because uh, there was a, a guy I used to know that, uh, that went there and, uh, you know, it, it was after sort of the glory days. And, but when he went and he's like, yeah, man, this place was a complete shithole, <laughs> which was <laughs> apparently not something that was, uh, you know, uh, a, a big surprise to everyone that had been a regular attendee there, but just sort of for the vibe out of, I'd have loved to have been there like around 83 or 84 when the Freebird Von Eric thing was just, you know, at its at its peak because it was just supposedly absolutely insane. The the crowd and then the reactions going on. And, uh, you know, I remember Meltzer telling me the story about how he was there the night that uh, I remember when uh, uh, Kevin comes to the ring and it's like, you know, it's like the, the three brothers versus the three birds and, uh, you know, and. Uh, Kevin grabs the house mic and he says, you know, the, the Freebirds want everyone to believe that uh, this is a war between, uh, you know, the state of Georgia and the state of Texas. So what this really is, is a it's a war between decency and filth. And uh, and, and Meltzer said that at that point, parts of the crowd started going, we love filth. We <laughs> love filth. You know, something like that. So that, that would have that have been a lot of fun to be part of. I, I consider myself lucky. I, I got to see a whole bunch of different arenas, uh, you know, Boston Garden a million times, Madison Square Garden once, Philly Spectrum, Philly Civic Center, Memphis Mid-South Coliseum. But if I could pick one. Uh, or, see, there's yeah. one I never was at. You, you got me on that one because uh, I would have certainly loved to have been there. Yeah, it was – I mean, it was – the building was nothing spectacular, and when I went there, it was 1995, Jeff, and they, the white – there was a white section and a black section. It was unreal. Uh, it probably was even worse in the uh, 60s and 70s. <laughs> yeah, you know, so. I, I didn't really notice anything when I went in 88, but I definitely noticed in 95. I'm like, you know, what the hell, people? And Because um, we, we bought tickets, and the person's like, are you sure you want to sit there? I'm like, yeah. And, you know, I'm sitting in the black section, and everyone was cool. But, you know, you, you could tell there was a clear divide and crazy. Anyway, I would have picked the Los Angeles Olympic Auditorium if I had to go to see one show. Uh, and, you know, not in the 80s when it was dead but like in the 70s when they had uh chavo guerrero and roddy piper and all that good stuff uh wow yeah that was a building that was uh supposedly crazy and uh some of the stuff that piper used to do to get heat with the uh the latin fans was just kind of uh <laughs> like you know god bless roddy piper because man uh, that guy uh 
he uh, certainly lived at the end of that proverbial lightning bolt with some of the yes. stuff that he was saying. And, you know, like uh, where literally Chavo wanted to fight him in the dressing room and he'd be like, you know, hey, I'm trying to I'm trying to make us both money here. You know, cause he would go out there and, uh, you, know, you know, the famous incident where he said, uh, I'm going to have Mrs. Uh, Guerrero in my corner. Chavo's mom uh, is going to be in my corner next week. And then next week he shows up and he like brings a donkey out to the uh, out to ringside. And, and like, you know, Chavo is all upset and, you know, and and. Piper's like, dude, it's an angle. What are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> uh, some guys took it all a little too seriously. Yeah, Jeff, apparently. what's the biggest dump of an arena that you've ever gone to for wrestling? Oh, let me think. Are, are you talking about for like an indie show or are you talking about oh. for like, a, you know, because I, you know, like I've been to wrestling in tents, you know, like in uh, Central, like Dusty's promotion that he tried to revive. You know, like we went to a show, uh, it was Dusty versus, um, oh, God. Uh, uh, Big Steelman? No, 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 no. It was, uh, I can't think of the guy's name now. Uh, the guy that worked, uh, used to just saw his head off um, all the time. Um, great great uh, mic work, great promo guy. Uh, wasn't big. And I remember when I first saw him, I was like, wow, this guy's going to be like the future of the business because he was so great on the mic. And now I absolutely uh, I can't think any. I think he works for one of the companies like behind the scenes, like, uh, you know. Um, but anyway, so w- I went to see Dusty face this guy uh, and it was like around. Uh, I think it was in Deland, Florida, home of venerable Stetson University. Go Hatters. My daughter went there, John. Uh, ah. And uh, it was like literally in a tent. You know, so uh, that that was not a really and, you know, we went to see ECW shows in Orlando and they were in a giant tent, too. You know, it's like uh and really, you guys can't afford like a high school gym or something like that. What about you? <laughs> I mean, that's I forgot. You guys have like you know rodeo arenas down there. Where you oh yeah, the daily rodeo arena where that the shower after the after the show was a hose. <laughs> nothing said uh, here. Uh, you need to uh, clean up. Uh, here's the hose. Go ahead. <laughs> The worst place I've ever went to see wrestling was it was actually WWF at the old Worcester Auditorium. That place was just, I mean, it was so run down. It was insane. All right. I'm going to take a next question from Ron Wayne. I've asked a previous version of this question from the late 70s, so it's time to go to the other end of the decade. I like this question. Of the world champ, don't, uh, please, Ron's going to get a big ego now when you say that. Of Ron world, Fountains of Wayne. Yeah, exactly. Uh, of the world champions on January 1, 1970, AWA champ Vern Gagne, NWA champ Dory Funk Jr., WWF champion Bruno San Martino, which one would fit best as champion of one of the other companies? What say you, John? Believe it or not, Vern Gagne, I think, would have made an excellent WWF champion in the 1970s, as long as, you know, he had the correct buildup. Uh, he was a big star out here in the 50s and 60s, so, you know, why not? I also think Bruno San Martino would not have been a a standard NWA champion, but I think he would have gotten over and he would have drawn. You know, I think as I look at this question, I think every guy that he mentions here <laughs> were perfect for their own particular territory. Yes. You know, Bruno was, was a tremendous ethnic draw with the Italians in the Northeast. Uh, Vern, uh, the all American white meat baby face up in Minnesota and the Midwest and Dory in the NWA as the traveling champion uh, who could work babyface in Texas and heel in Florida and all over, you know, he could, he would be that tweener heel. And it's funny because, you know, that we have uh, people that we both know that look back and they say Dory Funk Jr., you know, like uh, was uh, was a really boring world champion and he was a boring wrestler. And, you know, I was going to address that. Well, and, you know, I think people that say that are looking at Dory Funk Jr. through the eyes of 2022, not not through the eyes of 1972, 50 years ago, because 52, you know, 50 years ago, Dory Funk Jr., man, you wanted to see him get his ass kicked when he fought Jack Briscoe in Florida, you know, and he had a great way of j- just doing really subtle stuff like, you know, he would start out, he'd shake the hand and you sit there and go, OK, he's going to be a, uh, you know, be a scientific wrestler. And he'd get out there and everything would be going fine. And then suddenly they'd be a, a, a lock up into the corner and he'd slap the guy. And, you know, then he'd start, you know, doing like maybe, you know, uh, giving a low blow to somebody. 
and he just would slowly build. And if you watch the uh, the All Japan stuff, and it's funny because Barry and I, for our next episode, we're doing a match from All Japan in the late 80s. And I talk about how All Japan, they did such a great job of building the match from the beginning to the end. It's not like jumping out with a house on fire, like one minute into the match. But by the end of the match, the crowd's losing their mind. And that's the way that Dory Funk Jr. matches were, uh, where, you know, he slowly did this build. And by the end of the match, you're like, I want this guy to get his freaking ass kicked, you know? And that's the way they died. I remember going to matches in West Palm Beach and, uh, one of the, uh, one of the guys that I've been, uh, wrestling friends with and, and buddies with for over 40 years, my, my boy Craig Halleck. I remember we were at a match and I think it was like, Terry and Dory versus like, uh, Butch Reed and Sweet Brown Sugar or something like that. And, you know, it kind of broke down at the very end of the match and they're uh, walking back to the dressing room and we went up and, and Craig, Craig as Dory is walking by, go, goes, man, your father would be ashamed of you. Oh God. And, and, and like, <laughs> like he said it and I was like, dude, what are you saying? <laughs> like he's going to jump on a line and kick your ass. And, but that was the way that you went from. Oh wow, this is going to be like a scientific match. We're going to see each guy's scientific abilities to your father would be ashamed of, you know, like that's the, that's, that's the way that it turned in 30 minutes, you know, and give him credit where it's due. I, I think he was really good at doing that. My, my boy Funk- Snap has joined me in the room, the new dog, John. Oh, I'm that's glad you got a new dog. So say hi to Snap. Hello, Snap. Is that what you named him, Snap? Uh, it, well, actually, when we got him from the Humane Society, his name was Snap Dragon. They named him after a flower, John. I didn't think that was a good idea for a dog to be named after a flower, so we just shortened it to Snap. So, but uh, my my, th- that's funny. My brother adopted a cat from the Humane Society like five years ago, and they named him Mister Vancouver. And my brother just shortened it to Van. But anyway, well, there you go. <laughs> but I'm more formal. I call him Mister Vancouver. Yeah, I have seen. Too many. I, there are a lot of people who are like, oh, Dory Funk Jr. He was boring. He was not that good. I have seen too many excellent Dory Funk Jr. matches for that to be possible. I, I mean, and it's a different style of wrestling, but it's not boring. The late, great Harry White once told me Dory Funk Jr. was the best NWA champion he had ever seen. And I looked at him like, hey, wait a minute. You've seen Jack Briscoe. You've seen Ric Flair. He's like, yep, yeah, Dory was the best. And Dory, you know, I talked last week, I don't know if it was last week, it was before that, like, one of my friends, Playboy Buddy Rose would get on TV in the WWF in 1982, and this guy would lose his mind. Buddy Rose was the guy who could make him snap. Dory Funk Jr. 217 pounds, thank you. He wasn't even doing that yet. He would be out there with the girl wrestlers as his valets, and this guy, like I say, he would snap. I would not even touch one of those girls. I don't know what's wrong with this guy. He's fat. Do Do you remember who one of his valets was, by the way? Sherry Martell. Exactly, yeah. yeah. And but Dory Funk Jr. was that guy for me because he didn't have much of a physique. He was a bald guy, and I thought he was such a weasel. He, you know, I used to get Florida uh, on cable in eighty and eighty one, and Dory would come out and he'd start a fight with Mike Graham, and Mike Graham would get in the ring and be like, "Come on, come on!" And Dory would be like. I can't do this right now, Gordon. I have a wedding to attend. And I'm like, you have no wedding to attend. You're just scared. Well, what, what about the uh, the angle where uh, Billy Jack uh, was? Uh, they were pushing him as the lead baby face after Dusty left, and uh, Dory Funk Jr. is there. And he's he's talking to Gordon at the desk, and Billy comes out and he says, "Oh, Mr. Funk, I just wanted to come out and introduce myself. I'm a uh, Billy Jack, uh, and you're my second favorite wrestler. My first favorite wrestler is Dusty Rhodes." I yeah, and Dory, Dory slaps, slaps him. him. Yeah, <laughs> like no shit. Of course you're gonna get slapped for saying something like that. You're yeah. the best. I think I think he said Jeff. And correct me if I'm wrong. I think you're the best wrestler in the world next to Dusty Rhodes. Yeah, it was something like that. But it, it, was, yeah, it was something very, it was like very that. Funny. Yeah, but it was so. like you know, Billy. <laughs> you just insulted the man. You dumb, dumb ass. Yeah. So and, next question: Who you got? Next question, and you know what? I know you have to go, so we'll come close to wrapping it up. SK Lee, favorite video game of all time. Jeff, do you have one? Sadly, I have to say that 
I am in the anomaly uh, in the pro wrestling uh, fandom because I never got into the whole uh, video game things. There's uh, nothing I, sad about that. I, I am old enough to say that uh, I like going to the old arcades. Uh, any kind of video games I played uh, were at the, you know, the air hockey. I love playing at the arcades. That was always fun. I like to play the uh, different uh, uh, Malibu racing, uh, those kind of things. And I like the one where you're, uh, you're going, uh, doing the downhill skiing thing, but like, you know, uh, you know, Frogger and, uh, you know, uh, or Sonic the Hedgehog and all that kind of shit from the 2000s. I have absolutely no idea what the fuck people are talking about. I don't know what the best game system is, you know, now my kids, they definitely are fucking into that. My damn son, he's like online, uh, hardly, uh, anytime that he, he's not working, he's usually online in some sort of frigging gaming tournament, you know, uh, I think he's called like stick or something like that. That used to be his name. And he competes in all these friggin' tournaments. And apparently he's got some sort of national rep, but, uh, I have no idea what damn games he plays though. What about you? Wow. Well, first of all, if you're old into the old, like arcade games, about an hour north of here in Laconia, New Hampshire, there is a place, I forget the, I think it's called Fun Spot, where they have all of the old games from the seventies and eighties and they all actually work and they keep them in pristine condition. And I make that trip about once every year. My favorite non-sports game, of course, Madden's my favorite game. My favorite non-sports game of all time used to be Red Dead, Red Dead Redemption. But uh, what is it? Uh, Grand Theft Auto V has passed that. I, it, it is just a phenomenal game. It is fun to play. The graphics are awesome. The characters are awesome. The, the world that you get to live in is, is just completely endless and awesome. I love that game. My wife's all-time favorite video game is, and I always, I'm never sure if I pronounce this right, is it Galaga or Galaga? Galaga. Yeah, yeah. That that's we always joke whenever we have a discussion that involves video games, she'll bring that up and like you know you go into uh, your uh, your Walmart or something like that and you go into the uh, the video game section you always see uh, the the sort of uh, miniaturized version of like Pac Man and and Galaga and stuff like that that you can buy for like I don't know like two hundred bucks or something like that and my wife kind of always looks at me and she's like eh, you know if you're looking for an idea for a uh, birthday or a Christmas <laughs> that's not a bad thing to uh, suggest. So, I don't think it's a bad thing to suggest either. And Jeff, I'm going to end this show with a with an anecdote. And we'll be the judge of that, Mister. Go ahead. Okay. In 1981, guess what I had? A girlfriend, what? Jeff. That's no. Wait a minute. <laughs> For the entire year. Uh, she was one of them, but she <laughs> well, okay. was she was like she could not lose a Galaga. She was that good at it. Like she always had the high score. If she put in a quarter, she could be entertained literally for ninety minutes or two hours, whatever, until she finally decided to crash the ship and end the game. Hello, Paula. I hope you're doing well. Yeah, wherever you are. So, <laughs> so I think what the people really want to know before we uh, wrap up this segment, John. Is after the Tennessee Vols, good old Rocky Top, uh, after they beat the hated villainous Bama Crimson Tide, did you in fact have an erection? No, but uh, better yet, can you still maintain an erection at your advanced age? <laughs> Ah, well, let's talk about the Tennessee game. I literally, I wasn't crying, but I had tears in my eyes. That's, I mean, it was just unbelievable. It felt like they were going to find a way to lose, like, you know, the Tennessee Volunteers of the last 20 years always seem to do. And no, they, they pulled it out. And I think, uh, Nick Saban made a couple of mistakes in that game. But, uh, by the time this recording comes out, Jeff, it's going to be the week of the Georgia game. Hopefully, Tennessee puts away Kentucky. Kentucky He's way better than people think, and that's going to be the biggest Vols game in a long, long time. So let me ask you, uh, up to that point when you said you almost cried, what was the last uh, – I'm not talking necessarily uh, specifically Tennessee football, but I know that uh, you know, you're know you a baseball fan and other sports too. What was the sporting event that you found yourself so happy with the result that you almost cried? Uh, 2004 Red Sox, no questions asked. I'm going to say 2016, after 108 years of futility, I never thought in my lifetime that the Cubs would ever win the World Series. And uh, my wife and I had had a chance to go up 
to Chicago that year for a game. It was the first time, amazingly, and all the years that I'd followed the Cubs, uh, because the Cubs, the reason the Cubs were my team is they were my first little league team. <laughs> That's how I latched onto them. Okay. Know? And, uh, I had never been to a game at Wrigley Field. My wife and I went up there and we joined, uh, our, uh, friends, uh, that I went to high school with. She and her husband, uh, who are Cardinals <laughs> fans, they went up to uh, Wrigley and they met us up there for a, a Cardinals Cubs game. Thank God the Cubs won that game. I would have never heard the end of it if they hadn't. But then that, <laughs> that season, at the end of the season, they won the, uh, the World Series. And that was, of course, the famous game seven against Cleveland when they had the, uh, the rain delay. Like, uh, was it the bottom of the eighth or the top of the ninth or something like that? And Cleveland had come back and tied it. And, you know, and Jason Hayward supposedly gave the big motivational speech in the, in the locker room that uh, we need to go out there and, uh, and kick ass and win this game. And you know what? I'll say this. Jason Hayward's contract completely overpriced. They paid way too much for the guy, but you know what? Much like, you know, certain people you think, do we win the World Series title without that guy giving that speech? And if the answer is no, then his contract was worth it as far as I'm concerned. Interesting. I, I'd never heard that story before. Um, I mean, usually it's the guy, the guy who gives the speech is your best player. If it's, you know, the 24th, 25th guy on the roster, like, okay, pal, shut up, you know, but if, if he made the speech and it worked and you're right, it's absolutely worth the World Series title. Hopefully we'll get to hear all of this. Uh, hopefully it got recorded. Jeff, you were an excellent guest as always. I waited too long to have you back. Thank you for coming. Really? I mean, so. like, you know, you, you wait all this time, but you yeah, Jamie Ward, popular guest host, Jamie. Really? Really? Oh, yeah, his damn Phillies are in the World Series, so I guess you had to. <laughs> he he, he like did the series, WWF 82. Who huh? do you like? Astros or Phillies? Who you got? I, I, you know what? I have a lot of Philadelphia Phillies friends, for, uh, fans who I am friends with, but, I mean, the Astros are, are overwhelming favorites, as, as well they should be. Well, I hate to tell uh, my Philly fans this, but uh, I really don't want Bryce Harper to win the World Series title. So why not? Uh, it just kind of comes off a bit douchey to me. That's uh, you know, great player, a tremendous hitter, came through, absolutely one of the great clutch uh, uh, home runs and hits in uh, in Philly's history and in baseball history. But it just always comes off a tad douchey to me. But uh, anyway, as opposed to Jose Altuve. Well, yeah, there there is the whole, you know, if you hear, uh, you know, the sound of trash cans banging in the background at the uh, the World Series, uh, you know, how many guys are left on that team from that 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 scandalous time? Not very many. Yeah, it's like Altuve and maybe you, what, three or four other guys. Uh, the rest yeah. of them have kind of gone their own separate ways. I mean, I, you know, in my take on that, well, I was never as outraged by it as everyone else. If you are on the field on the opposing team and you're hearing trash cans and you don't do anything about it, that's on you. Well, you know, to quote the legendary Bobby Heenan, if you ain't cheating, you ain't trying, you know. So. <laughs> All right. Let me wrap this up, Jeff. I know you mentioned that you got, you're going out to eat with your lovely life, Kim. So thank you again for coming. I really appreciate you taking the time. Absolutely. And I want to thank everyone for listening. We'll be back next week. I want to thank uh, Brian Lass for giving me this forum. I want to thank Lou Kippelman for all the great work he does producing this show. And this has been a production of the Arcadian Vanguard Podcast Network. Go Vols. This concludes our podcast day. 